Okay, I think I'm just going to um go ahead and get started. So hopefully people in the also oh, yeah, let's see. I'm giving it a lot of space here, but all right. So welcome everybody to our San Diego oil spill response uh, workshop. My name is Vivian Matuk. I'm the environmental voting program manager for both the California State Parks and the California Coastal Commission. And I want to give the opportunity to um, introduce my colleagues. So Cindy, I'll just start with you. And if you want just to introduce everybody. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. This was uh, such a fun event for Vivi and I, and, and you'll meet Andrea Moore and some other staff from Oscar as well. Um, so thank you again for being here and participating, not only here in person, but our folks that are uh, participating online as well. My name is Cindy Murphy. I work for Department of Fish and Wildlife, Office of Civil Prevention and Response. And I oversee our local government grants and outreach uh, coordinator. And I also am the uh, tribal liaison. And I just started uh, working with tribes in the uh, last year. So again, happy to be here. So to let me let me interrupt for a sec. Are people uh, joining us virtually, uh, how is the sound? If you can just give me a thumbs up or somebody. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And yeah. just please keep telling us if you're hearing okay. The point is that we embrace everybody, not only the people here, but also you guys. That's very important for us. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Lieutenant David McNair, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, in the office of a uh, OSPER. Spill prevention and response. Uh, I'm actually the supervisor that covers this uh, county as well as Orange, Imperial, uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, um, Inyo, and Mono. Um, so cover a large area. Uh, knock on wood. Most of our activities uh, is on the coast, um, unfortunately, on the coast, but uh, don't have to cover that desert much. Do you want to go to the right or do you want to go back? I think Jim. Whatever you prefer. Good morning. I'm uh, Jim Cannison, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Office of Spill Prevention Response, and uh, I'm an oil spill prevention specialist. So I've been doing this, I've been in this field for about 30 years down in LA Long Beach and worked for the department for about 10 years now. So this is my first time at this event. So bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> You've already done great. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mercy. <laughs> My name is Andrea Moore. I am also a local government grants outreach coordinator working with Cindy Murphy in our liaison unit. I'm also the statewide volunteer uh, coordinator in the event of a spill. And uh, I also, oh boy, it's a lot. I'm also a liaison officer for the Office of Spill Prevention and Response um, with Cindy Murphy. So I'm glad to be here and I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Victoria. I am the Super Boss. Prevention Branch Chief for OSPR, so statewide. Um, and the way OSPR is put together, we have three field offices, one in Seal Beach, one in Bakersfield, and then one up in Fairfield, California. But, but then we have satellite offices outside of that that covers pretty much the balance of the coast. Um, so I've been doing these workshops with Cindy for years and, and it's and it's really fun to get out and see the, the marina folks. And it, it's kind of what I come from, Jim. It's kind of in the same situation as is before the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I was a boat mechanic of all things and working on these docks and all up and down Southern California. So um, thanks for having us. We appreciate being with you guys. All right, perfect. So we're going to do a couple of things that is better if I see. <laughs> um, so we're going just to make sure that uh, we have some ground rules. And before we get started, please make sure that your cell phones, especially for the people here, are uh, turned off. Let me just do that because last time I forgot to do that. So make sure we do that. Um, but we also want to express our deep gratitude to the Coronado Jack Club for hosting us today and also for the amazing morning refreshments they have for us today. So sorry for people joining us virtually. <laughs> We're enjoying amazing uh, morning refreshments. I hope you are having a fantastic Colombian coffee for sure. Uh, for people here in the uh, joining us, uh, the restrooms are, as soon as you exit this room, 
to your right, and then they will be found on your right, and there are some also on the left. Um, let's see, for people joining us uh, virtually, I know you're experts on these uh, virtual uh, meetings. Um, we hope that you can all turn on your uh, cameras if possible. So we'll make sure that we make these more personable and I, we will feel your energy joining us here today. However, we understand that sometimes the cameras or the Wi-Fi doesn't allow you to do that or you don't have a camera. So we totally understand that. Everybody will be muted, not because we don't want to hear your beautiful voices, but it's because this system tends to create a lot of background noise and we want to make the workshop as pleasant as possible for everybody. Uh, we have devoted, as you saw in the agenda, specific times for you to ask questions. So we are going to ask our friends joining us virtually to please refrain from using the chat as much as possible is because sometimes we get distracted by that. We think that something is happening to you. Uh, so you will be able to uh, ask questions either by unmuting yourself or also using the, the chat or also raising your hand. We have two colleagues here helping us monitoring the, the chat. So we're not going to leave you, you know, by yourself. All right, let's check uh, quickly the handouts you're receiving today. So uh, first of all, you have uh, the California uh, uh, Marinas and Yaclops Field Response Communication Toolkit or Packet. Uh, then you have, for the people joining us here, a yellow small booklet for our people joining us virtually is the one entitled California Hazardous Materials um, handout that you see in the upper right corner of your slide. Then we have another handout entitled Recommended Resources for Oil Spill Cleanup for Marinas and Yacht Clubs. And then we have uh, frequently asked questions about the Oil Spill Response uh, Equipment Grant. So we have a great group today. Um, it will take us a while to let the people in uh, here with us and also you guys joining us virtually to um, introduce yourself. So I put together a summary and a map of the people who are registered here today. And as you see, we have amazing representation from not only our beautiful coastal counties, but also inland areas. So we're going to treat everybody the same, embracing you all. And we also have uh, people joining us from two Nevada counties. So we are going to brag about what California does so well. Sorry, <laughs> yes, but we want to embrace you with our education and outreach, that for sure. Let's review the agenda really quickly. So after these introductions, oh, and I forgot to mention um, that you're pretty much your background. So we have uh, private and public marinas, nonprofits, uh, staff with ports, yacht clubs, recreational boaters of California representation, the fire department, and also some members from the Coast Guard Auxiliary. In terms of the agenda, after the introductions, um, I'm going to quickly uh, give an update about why we're here, and then I'm going to um, let our colleague uh, David McNair to talk about uh, the California oil spill response structure. Then we will have the devoted time for questions. After that, I'm going to be talking about the toolkit that you're receiving today then questions, then we will have a 10 minute break. Uh, after that, we're going to come and uh, Jim uh, mm -hmm. with OSPER, Office of Spill Prevention and Response, will help us to go through different case scenarios and lessons learned and best management practices. Questions, and finally, um, uh, my colleague Cindy will be talking about the oil spill response grants uh, and resources for voting facilities. All right. so. Based on the information that you receive via email, social media, or uh, any other source, and as clearly stated there, what we're going to learn today is first about the California oil spill response structure. Uh, we're going to review the packet or toolkit. Then we're going to focus on real case scenarios. And finally, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the grants from OSPER. Um, so we're going to start this um, a training or workshop better with some interaction because that's what it's all about. So I'm going to be uh, launching here. Let's see if I can do that. Bear with me for a sec. I just forgot where the 
examples are, hmm, if not, we'll just do it. Bear with me for a sec. Where is the poll? Oh, here it is. So I'm going just to um, start with a poll, and I would appreciate if people are joining us virtually, once I launch the poll, take your time to please um, participate. I'll give you a minute, and I'm going to ask the question to the people joining us here. Uh, and again, please be sincere. If you don't know nobody, don't even look at their uniforms. They're not going to take notes and go after you. The point is that <laughs> this is about education. We want to be your best friend, so that's the point. So. Do you know who is your county office of emergency services? Be sincere, say yes, no. I don't even know what you're talking about. So people, as you see, they're uh, responding uh, virtually. How about here? How many of you do know who your county office of emergency service is? One, other than that, no? Okay, perfect. So. Uh, let me stop here for a sec, and we're going to share the result, the, the resources with everybody here at the poll. So as we see virtually, 63% of the people don't know, 38% uh, know, and here in the room, only one person. So we have a total of, I, I haven't counted, like 10 people here. Uh, uh, only one person knows about that. Great. We're going to cover that later on and the importance. Okay, so let's move into the second poll. Let me see. Um, okay, let's go back and we're going to launch question two. Question two says, does your facility, again, if, either if it's at Yacht Club or a marina, uh, have a spill plan in place? So raise your hand people here, like a bunch of you. Good, fantastic, let's keep one full of oh, 30 more seconds to our people joining us virtually. We want full participation, so that's perfect. And I know some of you are seated with others in the room, so I totally get that response representing your full um, facility. All right, it seems that let me end the poll here and share the results. So let's go now with the people here in the room. I would say, in my opinion, that probably 70 percent of the people responded yes and now let's check here we have 11 percent no 78 yes 11 percent uh, uh, do not know fantastic we're going to cover that as well all right let's go back to now question three and it says do you know what your neighboring marina and yacht club have in terms of oil response equipment Again, no clue. You say, oh no, I don't have any clue. Yes, I know. How many of you do know? Okay, so here in the room, um, we have zero for that, so it would be no. And we're waiting for our friends uh, joining us virtually. Let's see. Okay, 30 seconds, that's good. Let me end the poll and share the results. So here in the room, people say, Zero, Vivian, I don't have any clue. And people in our um, virtual uh, room says 56% do not have any clue and 44% says yes. Yeah, good information. All right. Question four. How do you report an oil spill at your facility? So the first option, and I, I'm not, I don't want to read it to you so you can tell me what you guys think. And if you don't know, again, that's why we're here. We're going to learn. Oh, it says, sorry, it says, I, I do not report, but I make sure it is prevented in the future. To be honest, I don't know. And uh, the bottom one is report to both the National Response Center and the State Warning Center. What do you guys think? One, two, or three? Three. 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 Okay. I would say good. So here in the room, um, and let me share. Here in the room, we had 100% option C. And then as you all can see in your screens or here in the room, we have 75% got it at the bottom and then 13% for each. I don't know. And um, I just make sure that it doesn't happen again. All right, and let's go finally to the last uh, question from the poll. 
Have you heard about the Office of Spill Prevention and Response Refunds Equipment Grant? If you don't know, don't worry, we're going to learn that today. How many of you have heard? Okay, so we have one, heard two. Okay, just two people here in the room. I'm giving you until 30 more seconds for the people uh, joining us virtually. We want full participation. All right, let's share results. So here in the room, I would say like probably 60% have heard about those grants. Um, in our virtual room, we have 80% and uh, no, they have no clue. Fantastic opportunity. You're going to uh, learn that today. Finally, 20%, yes. All right, let's just stop sharing. Okay, so uh, we decided to put together these questions because that's exactly what you're going to learn today. So once we're done, what we want you to leave the room is with that knowledge, trying just to make sure that you know how to respond every single question. So what we wanted just to emphasize is that you just realize that there are a couple of things that you came and it's going to be a worth and morning for you to spend some hours with us, with us here today. All right. So why we're here today, it turns out that as a response or as a result of large scale oil spill incidents that have happened across the state, efforts have been made um, among the federal, state, local agencies uh, uh, to work with marinas and yacht clubs in case those uh, spills happen. And as a result of that effort, um, back in like, nine years ago, we decided to put together a working group represented by all the interested parties, not only the federal agencies, the state, local agencies, but also representatives from your organizations and associations, private and public marinas, as well as yacht clubs. And we also have representatives from the recreational uh, voters of California. The goal of that working group was to exactly identify, okay, if there's a spill inside or outside marinas or yacht clubs, what are the resources we can share with marina and yacht club operators to make sure that they can properly respond or know what to do and how they can tune up all the, uh, the processes. Again, the goal of this workshop is that is for us to remember that being proactive is the best way or or to prevent us is the best way to control that pollution. Also that emergencies are better handled as a team effort, right? And also to bring you to you the experts for your local resources so you can count on them. Um, I know they will be delighted, hopefully I'm talking okay here on behalf of all of them, to hear from you if you have any questions because what we want to do is to work as a team. And also to remind you people also joining us virtually, this is the perfect opportunity for you to ask questions. Don't feel afraid of asking questions. If you have a question, you need a response and that's why we are here, just to try to help you, okay? So we created as a resource the toolkit that you're seeing on your screen that you have handy also here in the room that we will be covering in one of the agenda items later on. And as a result also, we realize, hey, we have to go to you. So we have been conducting uh, 19 workshops across the state with over 500 participants, people like you. And this is the version two of that original uh, workshop that we put together. What is the difference that we heard you? We have evaluation forms every time that we conduct uh, workshops like this. And you told us we want to hear more about case scenarios that have happened in reality. And that's what we're focusing a portion of the workshop uh, today. In addition to that, thanks to this effort, um, we as a team have been able to have a better and more transparent communication when there's a spill. So for example, bringing an example that is kind of recent, the Orange County spill, uh, we decided, okay, we need to make sure that we communicate with our yacht clubs, with our marinas, to make sure that they know what's the latest and greatest. And that has been one of the outcomes of this workshop, just to work together as a team so you know what's going on, how you can inform your tenants, your members about what's uh, happening and what resources are also available to all of you. All right, so having said that, we're going to stop here for a sec. And uh, now I'm going to uh, invite my colleague, David, to take over the floor. So let me just uh, stop sharing here the screen and I'm going to change here um, our, our... Um, Where you want? 
Okay, let me hold on. Let me just uh, share with you here. Now turn on here your and you want to stand anywhere? Is there, there, I don't see an X on the floor. Where you want me? <laughs> it is not like a beauty contest. Oh, okay. uh, so, <laughs> this is your um, and, and let me stop for a sec. Are people joining us virtually okay in terms of sound? Are you following us okay? Is everybody doing okay down there? If you can give me some signs of survival down there, fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Dave here. Yep. Okay. Oh, I, I thought the people virtually was going to get lucky, and I have to uh, look at this old guy here. But uh, looks like you get to view me as well. And I apologize in advance for the folks here. Uh, that's why you got dessert, you know, or uh, breakfast. Uh, you already heard who I am, Dave McNair. Again, for uh, people that I forget, like I do. Uh, I didn't say I've been with the agency for 22 years, last seven with OSPR and as a supervisor for OSPR. Um, been a been at a few responses. We don't like to talk about that one in Huntington Beach that took uh, took uh, my life away for a while, but uh, um, it was a good outcome. And honestly, a lot of that outcome, good outcome is um, you mm -hmm. folks that are out there in the marina is a, that are the users of the waterways and stuff because your, your eyes or ears um you'll learn about the grant program i tell you what i have a few uh, uh marinas harbors that have these trailers and and uh, or work with the local jurisdictions and yes i'm a first responder but and not quite honestly you folks there are the first responders you're there seeing it immediately and reacting by calling it in and then there's now some other tools that maybe we could throw a boom out real quick and keep it from becoming a bigger issue before we can get out there or before we can get our uh contractors out there to start booming and cleaning up so um I, I thank you in advance for taking the time to hear me yak and and learning about our great program that all the agencies combined together has worked on for uh, a few years now. Um, real, I'm a big believer in this program. Um, I've seen it in action itself. Um, all right, so let me go ahead. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, let's see, can you teach this old dog new tricks? Let's see, forward? No. I still play with Atari. <laughs> Vivian, I don't know if that's the right. I was, I was uh, that's Jim's. That's oh, Jim's. Jim's so for a so, Sorry yeah. for a second. Well, hey, let's get Jim out. Let's just <laughs> throw it up, man. He's trying to hide in the corner. Okay, let me. He, wasn't gonna say he that. wants me to break that. He wants me to break that ice first. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing a good job, Dave. I yeah. <laughs> okay, so she do this. All right. And I assume everyone's got that on their screen as well, virtually. Okay. Now it's working, sir. No, nope. you're on the wrong. Yeah, okay. you gotta go the she, really, she really doesn't want me to speak. Sorry. Sorry. What? Hold on. Let's see. So there you go. Yeah. This one. Okay. And then click on the first slide and the view, maybe. Okay. So it's this one. All right. That's good. Well, we're waiting for that. Oh just kind of educate you. Um, I do have a uh, officer that's uh, scientist. Um, got a new one coming with uh, lateral from a uh, local PD. Be is going through our training right now, and so be on board uh, during in the summer. And we do have a response boat here, uh, Shelter Island. So Osprey does have resources right here. Uh, he worked a lot with the uh, Coast Guard. Actually, I was just over here, I think a week ago, took Coast Guard out on a skiff, went up to Mission Bay, documented possible derelict boats that are potential threats. We came to San Diego Bay and just did that. Just a little offshoot of what we do when we're not responding. Well, uh, preparation, planning. Um, okay, so I am going to start off with... Uh, uh, but I guess that's what we're going to go over, California Pollution Laws. Uh, Osprey Field Response Team, what is that? 
uh, case studies. I believe Jim's going over that. And uh, response mm -hmm. equipment grant program. Vivian's going over that. Cindy, your colleague. Solid, Cindy, my colleague. <laughs> oh, you're going over the program. <laughs> okay. I, I, and all right, pollution response history. Uh, got some examples here. Actually, when I've had to present in the past, I did a little research and I was really uh, intrigued that actually some of the history of, uh, of uh, um, pollution uh, environmental laws and stuff came in effect during the gold rush. You know, the mercury that uh, was being washed down, uh, contaminants being washed down Clear Lake, uh, San Francisco Bay, kind of uh, was uh, tangible legacies of starting to have some rules and regulations, right? Um, um, in the gold rush days. And then uh, over time, you know, we all know about the 60s, uh, environmental movements, right? Start realizing that humans, we, we, uh, we, we do, uh, do a lot of damage of living on um, our environment. Um, you got, uh, but the big thing that specifically oil related Exxon Valdez, uh, if you all recall, uh, that was about 11 million gallons, uh, spill, uh, the outcome of that was the oil pollution act of 1990. This is important because it, uh, enforces the removal of spilled oil and signs liability to the responsible party for the cost of the cleanup and damage. Uh, required specific operating procedures, measuring the damage, right? I mean, we got damage, we got to know exactly the endpoints of those damages and establish funds for damages, cleanup, and remo removal costs. So that was very crucial. That was a big transition into what we do today. Um, what does this help develop, Osper? Um, and then uh, 1990. This kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? American Trader off the Huntington Beach. Uh, the oil tanker American Trader ran over an anchor, puncturing its hull and spilling an estimate of 416,598 uh, 416, gallons of crude oil off the coast of the Huntington Beach. Sounds a little familiar, right? We did the last one we had, uh, knock on wood. It was a lot more minimal, just spread out over multiple counties and but uh it was an anchor uh strike as well uh these events uh inspired the lean uh and correct me cindy i always kind of screw this up i'm not good with my english Lim limper keen sea strand act say that three times fast <laughs> yeah. i tried i can't even say it slowly once all right uh, this uh, established, established an administrator who was given the very broad power to implement the Provisions Act. In 1991, that's when Office of Spill Prevention and Response, OSPR, we love our acronyms, opened, headed by, uh, opened and headed by the administrator. Now, this is what's really great. It required industry to must, in quote, must have an oil spill contingency plan. Uh, demonstrate financial responsibility to pay for the spill cleanup and damages and participate in drills and exercises. A lot, I didn't know this until I got into OSPR that this was a thing that there's contingency plans, area contingency plans, and ACP as we call it. We have one right here, Sector 6, San Diego, right here. Uh, it goes all the way up to, was it San Clemente, I think, is the border or somewhere around there. Um, and uh, inland, goes inland a bit. And those are very detailed plan of how we uh, protect sensitive sites, environmental sites, uh, protect the uh, wildlife, um, how to clean it up, um, all those strategies. Uh, what what is there to protect? It documents the marinas, the the, the reserves, et cetera. Um, so uh, these folks are mandated to participate in drills on an annual basis, uh, tabletop drills. I go to a lot of them. We uh, um, people get trained in the uh, of the responsible party folks. Um, and what to do in case there was a spill and 
for you know acted out and and we all get together industry the the contractors the cleanup companies uh this um so forth um develop a unified man we'll talk a little more later about that um so now we have osper what is osper's mission it is to provide the best achievable protection of california natural resources by preventing preventing preparing and responding to spills of oil and restoring affected resources not just clean up we got we got to fix it right i mean what good is it just to clean it up and then it's permanently damaged and and also remember we got to make sure we clean it up without doing more damage uh, at the, the best possible now we are now osprey has become the public trustee and custodial response uh responsibility for protecting managing and restoring the state's fish and wildlife uh and plants uh, not just the cute fuzzy ones, every little, right? Because uh, every creature, every plant life, everything, their uh, ecosystem is, is important. Um, now, what's interesting, that went on, uh, our, our jurisdiction then was coastal zone, all right? Uh, and, and so limited, but not all oil spills happen in the coast on along the coast of the waterways state waterways right so in uh 2014 governor brown approved sb uh 861 it expanded our, our our jurisdiction um covering transportation oil by railroad which we thought that was gonna really beef up uh in um in the last few years pipelines and production facilities uh this Expansion provided critical administration funding for industry preparedness, spill response, and continued coordination with local, state, and federal government, along with industry and non-government organizations. Now it brought everyone to the table, work as a team, right? And I know some people say, why, why is the response party involved in it? Well, they know their product, they know their facilities, they know that they, they're crucial in reacting to this uh to clean up um so now guess what um 2014 after that now osper covers the entire state of california believe it or not like i i, I uh give you the list of counties i cover and i stated the fact that yeah we're usually busy more busy on the coast but there are times we're responding out to the desert we had train derailment out in the desert, we responded to. Uh, we had um, pipeline. We got pipelines coming across that Colorado River. How crucial is that if there's a spill in that river, right? So we are responding. Before that, when I was just a game warden working on the regular side, in Ventura County, and it was in the inland, I had to figure out how to react, respond to this oil spill. Because in Ventura County, anyone's been there, lived there, there's oil just coming out of that ground. I mean, and it's got so much old industry and undocumented in, uh, infrastructure. Uh, when it rains and pours, oil just starts popping up still to this day. Um, so um, now that we have Osper covering it all, it's been, um, I wish Osper was covering it all when I started as a game warden. My first year, I had no clue what I was doing. Um. And then, um, and then uh, in 2021, uh, Assembly Bill 148, uh, what that did is that uh, enacted legislation on renewable fuels and oil spill preventative response, right? Renewable fuels. That's the new thing, right? First responders are really having to educate themselves and change up their response to all these electric vehicles, right? I mean, we got, there's so many different uh other ref, uh, fuel sources now in in our infrastructure, we really have to start thinking ahead and 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 changing um, our response to certain fuels and so forth. Um, and uh, for us, renewable fuel fuels defined as any uh, you know it's defined as any liquid produced from non petroleum renewable resources that is used or usable as a fuel or sets of liquid. If you want the definition. Uh, I can give you more details, but uh, let me go ahead and uh, 
move it forward. And this is basically uh, what we cover. And I want to make sure I'm out of your way, Dave. Sorry okay. about that. I just realized I'm blocking a little bit of this room. I mean, I, I kind of cover a lot of screen. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, this is applying to certain or range, uh, or range of situation, right? Industry production pipelines uh, for San Diego is, is uh, San Diego. Number one, I think, is shipping is that we're we got huge bay a lot of industry right shipping products in and out you got the navy fleet right um uh that's a lot of our you know uh probably uh uh probably a high percentage of our call outs is uh mystery sheen so forth spills uh navy uh actually working with coast guard they're uh they're quick to respond on their stuff they're calling in their you know, I mean, three ounces of hydraulic fluids, they're covering, they're, they're calling it in now. They're telling, you know, um, transparency. Uh, it's been a really great collaboration with those uh, federal agencies. Uh, we don't really respond to the, the Navy facilities uh, because they have their own um, uh, teams that do the investigation cleanup and so forth. Um, marinas, lot, right? A lot of, I think this is probably, how many marinas we have in San Diego Bay? <laughs> Quite a few. I, I can't, I haven't even counted yet. I've been covering this area, what, seven years? I still haven't been to each one. Um, I need to. If you want to invite me out, let me know. I'll be happy to come out. Um, uh, let's see. But most recently, uh, uh, we're kind of, we had to focus on uh, mostly in Northern Cal railroad spills petroleum being transported that seems to be uh more frequent uh, uh that, and uh and one thing i see on here that we're missing is you know we have our tankers our facility our pipelines our railroad the pumpers but one thing i noticed on here that we're missing is um keeping uh fuel trucks a lot of fuel being transported on our highways uh, especially up in Santa Barbara, you know, they, uh, the pipeline been shut down there. More fuels going across the uh, 166. We've had an incident there a few years ago that I responded to as a state on scene coordinator. Uh, truck went off the side and fuel just went down the river, which was flowing and it goes into a reservoir, which becomes drinking water. So uh, how crucial is that, correct? I mean, that's something, and we get a lot of call outs for fuel trucks. Luckily, a lot of our infrastructure here, that fuel, the, the firefighters are really quick to respond and quick to uh, um, cover up our uh, dam uh, uh, storm drains because all storm drains lead to what? The ocean. So true. It might take a while, but it can still get there. Um, okay. And Cindy, make sure I stay on topic and make sure I stay on time because I have no idea. You let you just put me up here without a timeline. I just keep rolling. <laughs> so Dave, I'm your timeline. Okay. Right here. Five minutes. Oh, okay. see, she didn't she told me earlier. I'm going too slow. All right, protecting that. All right, mandate to respond. Protecting the water quality. Um. Five. Uh. You know, I mean, our goal is protecting the water, the quality of the water. Don't forget, though, life is always paramount first. Okay, um, uh, we're the trustees' responsibilities, and we involved into uh, multi-facets uh, pollution response role, incident command, and investigation. We'll go over that here. Okay, I already talked about. I mentioned this field response team. We have field response team. We have three teams. We have the north, the central, and the south. The south covers from uh, Ventura, LA, up to uh, uh, Mona uh, uh, and uh, Inyo, and then all the way south. Um, there's about, should be about seven officers, eight officers. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but that's what we focus on is uh, oil. And two supervisors. 
And that's the that's our wildlife officers. Okay. And then we have Jim. He's hiding somewhere. Uh, he's not up yet, but you know, the OSPSs and then the ESs. All right. We the team. They're 24 7. We have that three. They get called out or uh, get notified of uh, any oil spills that uh, affect the waterways and they go and uh, investigate. Um, Okay, what does the wildlife officer do besides write fishing tickets? All right, um, we serve as a stay on scene coordinator um, to ensure that the spill is. Uh, I feel like I'm like talking right on front on top of you, Dave. I'm gonna move over. Uh, yeah, remediate to minimize impacts to wildlife and wildlife habits. All right, um, I got my notes here. So basically. Uh, we're there as part of the Unified Command. The Unified Command will consist of a federal on-scene coordinator, that is either the Coast Guard or the EPA, uh, the S, the state on-scene coordinator, and um, the responsible party, um, an incident commander. And we now have focused more and more is getting the local on-scene coordinator. Uh, the well, local on scene coordinator for the say like the the Huntington Beach spill recently. That's two counties. We had one from Orange County and we had one from uh, San Diego County. They came out of the uh, your uh, uh, office of emergency emergency services uh, OESs. Uh, they're that they have the the uh, authority to speak on behalf of the county. All right, because we can't have every city uh represented in the unified command too many people in that unified command would bog things down so we kind of kind of narrow it down a little more however though local representation would be under the uh would fall under the liaison on a unified command um so as an incident commander um we talked about that uh but the the important thing as a uh, game warden and an Osprey, we're not just a state on scene coordinator, we're also investigators. And we have, especially on bigger spills and stuff, we have broken that off uh, to two different teams. Uh, we want the responders focusing so solely on the response. That's priority one. Let's get this stopped, contained, cleaned up, and mitigated. And then we have the investigation. The investigation, they want to find out why, how, what, what, you know, was there intent? Uh, um, which, you know, we don't need intent, but, but we do try to make sure people are following um, their standard operating procedures or their, the government codes and so forth and notifying as soon as possible. Uh, as required. Um, so that's that's our role as a as a um, game warden. Okay. I think point out, yeah. So point out. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Oh, sorry. I just one thing. Okay. Environmental scientists, the ESs. Something I kind of study a little bit myself. I want to be an e uh, environmental scientist, but I realize my brain more acts as a uh, officer. Uh, uh, the ESs, their role, they're the environmental unit leader. They're so on an incident, on a response, they're the ones that tell us what we the ACP, what we need to start protecting, what what's, uh, what species, uh, what sensitive sites. Um, they lead in the unified command on the environmental side. Uh, they're wildlife branch directors or uh, resource at risk for checks and priorities, like I mentioned. Uh, now, when I can as a game warden, I see scat, I'm thinking of animal poop, okay? <laughs> now, I didn't know there's an other thing called scat. Uh, shoreline cleanup and assessment, okay? That's crucial. I uh, We need to know what uh, the from the from the re source and where's the endpoint of the damage of this sort of the spill, right? And can we stop it? And need to stop it there 
and then assess what needs, what prioritize the cleanup, um, you know, what we need for those cleanups and so forth. Um, very, very crucial. Uh, and then while it's getting cleaned up, they're monitoring the cleanup. Because like I said earlier, we need to get this stuff cleaned up, but we need to be smart how we clean it up. Does it do, it's more harm than good when we go in there and we just start ripping, oh, all this eel grass has uh, uh, been a, a, a covered in oil and stuff. We'll just rip it out. Is that really the right place? Is that the right way to do it? Maybe just trimming it uh, of the impacted part of the grass so it will grow again quicker and not, not take out all the habitat. You know, something like that. Um, and then uh, and then they tell the state on scene coordinator, you turn when the cleanup endpoints have been met. They said, this is how we, this is when we consider it's cleaned up. And sometimes there might be incidents where we might leave some residue or something because if we try to get all that off, we might do more damage than, um, than good. And maybe let nature take its course. So some, you know, some of this product does break down and disintegrate eventually, right? Um, so it's, they're the expertise. And resource in injury assessment, what has, what's been damaged? Okay. There we go, I pointed it. All right, hey, see? Okay, I guess my aim's off. I better get back in the lab, in the office and start practicing this more. All right, we train with this. I got to train with this. Now, how we how we get notified on this? So, you call Marina calls who NRC National Response Center, or you have a number, an eight hundred number. You call. Hey, we got a spill. You call it out. They type it in. They send it to Cal OES, uh, office of California Office of Emer Emergency Services. And then it goes to our dispatch. Our dispatch determines what's what's one of the three where it falls in the three different uh, FRTs. Notify the people on call, and also what I didn't mention this earlier, as a uh, supervisors in Oscar, we also do a week long rotation on call too, where we cover an entire state, and we coordinate, make sure people are checking on these, you know, responding on these uh, uh, reports. Sometimes that, is this a phone call to a, let's say it's a fire that called it in or the Coast Guard, hey, we had this, they told us what it is, okay. Or we call the marina, we rely on the marina because you guys know your, 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 this is your turf, you know, hey, yeah, we had it, it dissipated already and we don't have, we don't know who the re responsible party is, okay. No, no further actions, right? What can we do if it already moved on and dissipated, so forth? So um, sometimes you'll get calls from our from one of our FRTs, um, and then um, but, but a lot of times we have to go out and respond and check it out ourselves and um, vet it. And then uh, that also we we coordinate a lot when it's on the coastal with the Coast Guard. Uh, co uh, uh, sector San Diego here are, uh, are fantastic for us because I have no one down here right now and I'm from Orange County and most of the other officers are from up north so our response time is extended that's why like we rely on uh, the marinas uh, uh, the, the folks that uh, work and uh, take care of the facilities uh, but the Coast Guard uh, will go out and investigate as well. So, so we, we, we collaborate. Um, that's how, that's an example of a OES report. Um, now, if it's something we're like, oh, darn, we got, we got a major issue here. You know, we start calling, we start calling, uh, goes to ODO, the FRT calls the ODO, like, oh, shoot, we need, we need response, you know, more people. We start getting the the cavalry come in. We get uh, other. You heard uh, uh, my colleagues with all their other hats they wear when they're not responding to a spill. Um, a lot of, a lot of people in Oscar wear many hats, and and uh, they'll 
start responding down to. They, they'll uh, leave uh, Sacramento and come down to beautiful Southern California. And, you know, they're really disappointed on that. <laughs> Although today's not really great. But, uh, <laughs> today is a unique day. It's it missing all the way down Orange County. Um, that's that's quick, down and dirty. Probably could have been quicker. Um, hopefully I didn't bore you. But, uh, questions will be at the end. Um, right now. Those but, are the questions oh, right now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Jim, I give you, you still got a break. Let, let's just start first with the, Put that bagel down. You're coming up next. No. Um, let's just start with the people uh, joining us virtually. And next time around, we'll let the people in the room start with questions. Any questions um, about what we just covered uh, based on the agenda? Just again, a, a big overview. We were just covering the oil spill response structure in California and some of the roles the Office of Spill Prevention and Response and their staff have in the field and a little bit about um, some uh, reporting. Based on that information, uh, do you guys have any questions, virtual people joining us right now? Gary is saying, okay, Nobby and the rest of the team uh, who have their cameras off. Do you have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and um, let us know if you have any questions. No questions, perfect, great, no questions? I I'm good. Okay, great. Excellent. And now people in the room, do you guys have any questions? So um, the bigger spills, they're responsible for funding the cleanup and what you guys do, right? And so, so let me repeat the question, sorry. Uh, the people in the room heard, uh, virtual room, did you hear the question? Did you hear the question? Somebody can just, no? Okay, can you repeat louder? Uh, and then please remember that we have people <laughs> virtually. Thank you, go ahead. So for the larger spills or any spills at all uh, conducted from somebody else, they have to fund uh, and pay for whatever you clean up and all the resources that you use? Yeah, um, so uh, usually, you know, if we have a responsibility, the responsibility, they have a choice. Start funding it, start working with us to clean it up. And if they refuse or can't do it, then okay, we will, depending, the feds uh, has a NASA uh, um, response fund. State does have a NASA response fund as well. Um, uh, however, though, that the responsible party will we'll take care of it because no matter what, it's going to get taken care of. However, though, uh, that that is tax dollars monies, right? We are responsible to go after that responsible party or investigate and determine a responsible party. Um, right? That's 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 the the that's the right thing to do. We got to find that person. However, though, there are times we can't find a responsible party. Okay, or it could be it could be infrastructure. Um, that the soul is prior abandoned prior to regulatory uh, mandates. Um, you know, it was abandoned prior to those regular um, uh, like pipelines. They used to be able to abandon them without cleaning them out, flushing them out. And so, I had an incident in the Huntington Beach. Uh, it was abandoned many, many decades ago. Um, it wasn't a responsible party. Um, so. Um, uh, however, though, there was in the sense that somebody did something to cause that damage. They were doing some, uh, channel work. Um, so they were held responsible, but then they, um, you know, so that there are some cases like that. So we will, uh, uh, the Coast Guard or the EPA will open funding. Like, for instance, the most common is a derelict that, Wash ashore and there's gasoline and other uh, hazardous materials when we don't have a uh, ownership of it, um, any, any ownership um, uh, background on it. Um, they'll open the fund just to take out those pollutants. That's all they can do. And then they, they walk away. And then that boat, the boat itself, is, is, is ends up being the responsibility if they want to get rid of it, who owns that land. 
North Island is very common, right? The Navy does take care of washed up boats after the pollutants have been removed um, um, or county beaches or so forth, you know, or the city. Yes, um, Wayne Strickland, I'm uh, with San Diego Association of Yacht Clubs and I'm a former Commodore here also. Um, we have the anchorage right off of Saviga Jetty um, off of North Island here in Coronado. And there's lots of times during storms, uh, boats and mainly kind of derelict boats are anchored there, abandoned, they wash up on the beaches. It, wouldn't it be better to maybe stop that anchorage because it's just a lot of abandoned boats that people don't want to claim anymore? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I've been out there many times. <laughs> I've been Would in, you mind repeating the question for Okay. Uh, yeah. And correct my pronunciation. How do you say it again? Seniga Jetty. Seniga Jetty. I've oh, heard it different ways, and I will probably pronounce it different ways in one city. <laughs> uh, off of uh, North Island there. That has been a, a headache for us, uh, for everyone, I should say, right? And again, the practice has been they wash ashore, Coast Guard, no no, no ownership, responsible party for it. They'll, they'll open the funds, take the pollutants out, and the Navy has uh, the means to discard the vessels, the, the, the boats that are washed ashore. Um, what's been going on in the last few years, the Coast Guard has been very proactive and, and, uh, coordinating with, uh, um, us with, uh, other local agencies. And now recently I, they are working on a grant, um, and hopefully it goes through federal grant, um, with the, uh, Port of San Diego. And to be able to fund the when they can do go through all the legal processing, right? You just can't take a you know I just abandoned car. I just let's say I find an abandoned car and I just can't as a, a law enforcement officer just say, okay I'm gonna have this towed and discard it. We have there's a lot of procedures, right? Got to make responsible to make sure it is uh, abandoned, uh, no ownership, uh, so forth. Um, so there is there's there are works in the uh in the planning stage and mm -hmm. and it's, it's basically comes with funding on and uh and uh to start removing more derelict vessels um you know uh it's all government so there's a lot of a lot of steps you gotta take right um i just like i said recently just took the coast guard out and they're being proactive and they're like the, the 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 hazmat pollution team of Coast Guard rely on us to take them on the skiffs and take them out, and they're documenting. And I actually it was an education for me how they're how they're starting to like document and see what actually there's signs of a derelict boat, right? So yeah, that 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 anchorage system out there though, um, so they're they're being proactive and there's works uh, something in the works. Um, and, but, uh, as for, I, I have no say on that anchorage, um, that is, that is a, uh, other, jur that's other jurisdictions, fish and, uh, fish, fish and wildlife, Oscar, we have no jurisdiction over that. Um, we, so, uh, uh you might have some answers being yeah. more than one of So also the, one of the agencies that I represent, the California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways, as you know. We have grants for abandoned vessels as well, uh, and also uh, different opportunities for boaters before they abandon the boat just to turn it in. It's, follow, it's part of the acronym SAVE it's a, a program. So we work with the different jurisdictions, so they apply for grants to be able to uh, deal with those boats. I can send tomorrow or later on this afternoon in a follow-up email the link to that program. So it's up to each of the counties or jurisdictions to apply to get money for uh, removal of the vessels. And of course, yes, there are some requirements because it's not like you found one and I'm going to remove it immediately. There are some steps to go through, but you know, there's a lot of coordination. Plus that funding is only for recreational boats, mm -hmm. not for commercial boats because we are mainly funded through Harbors and Watercraft Revolving Fund, which is money coming from recreational boating. 
but there are a lot of efforts. And it's a problem that is across the state. If you go to uh, the Oakland estuary, it's a problem. If you go to uh, you know the coast, et cetera. So it's a problem. But they're on the work. Yeah, we used to have an A8 anchorage in South Bay, uh, San Diego. <clears throat> and that A8, it, it was terrible because so many boats just were abandoned and sunk and it had to be removed. And, you know, it's polluting and so. Yeah, right. but th there's a lot of, I mean, resources that are being uh, used. Yeah, there's also an opportunity to do more. And I think that that's what we are trying just to do as a team, working with the federal, the state agencies, and the local governments, which at the end are the experts uh, on the ground, right? And I can send more information to you guys, yeah. Would this be available to the port as well? Uh, yes. Grant, these grants? Yeah, the question people in the uh, virtual room, if the grants are available to ports, I can send the, all the specifics so you can read that. Um, I work with them very closely. They are one of my colleagues, but I the, the specific questions, I cannot respond, but I will send you also the information of my colleagues uh, who work in that program. So you can ask any questions you may need. But you even have the list of grantees right there. Okay. Vivian, we do have a question in chat. Yes. So please. I just want to, in a small spill happens in a marina due to a boat, the owner should have coverage, uh, insurance coverage. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to share that with you. And and that does that does come up a lot. We I, that's amazing how many boat fires that we've already had five <laughs> I know of just in the L A uh, L A Long Beach Harbor <laughs> Marina. So yeah, I know is it that time of year for paying dues taxes on them? No. <laughs> so okay, just a bad joke. Uh, All right. Thank you so much, and um, we're behind the schedule, so... Sorry, Jim, I took up your time. So I told Cindy to keep me track, she didn't. Okay, so let's see where I can start. That's why I don't bother people here. Let's see. I want just to make sure that I will... What happened here? Oh, yeah, the owl will go. Okay, can you... Uh, people in the room see us still? Uh, in the virtual room, can you see us? Yes, thumbs up. Oh, that's weird because we cannot see them here. Hold on for a sec. Maybe it's just a view. Uh, okay, hold on for a sec. Sorry. Okay, so better just probably. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah, everybody. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that I'm properly standing so I don't block anybody. Be on top of Dave. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, basically, now we're going to quickly review the spilled response communication uh, packet. So if you are kind enough just to refer to that one, let's see. Okay, better if I see it doesn't like me at all there. Okay, all right. So the first couple of pages from that packet uh, that we put together for you explains exactly why we created uh, the working group, uh, the content of the packet, and also it invites you and your staff to make sure that you remember there are some uh, important uh, trainings that you should be taking, including the first responder awareness and the first responder operation trainings. And all we'll be talking about that later on in more detail. And also a link to uh, the incident, online incident command system courses. So you guys understand how the entire structure works in case of a spill. Don't worry, when I send you again a follow-up email, the toolkit will be included there. So all these crazy hyperlinks will be accessible to you. So you don't have to memorize and do anything. All right, so um, now the following page, uh, let's quickly review also what are some of the resources we want you all, marinas and yacht clubs, uh, and anybody who's uh, here with us today from boating facilities, uh, that you have a uh, need to have handy in case a spill happens um, outside of your facility, right? So what are those resources? We mentioned to you the importance of getting a hold of your county office of emergency services. We had a couple of incidents where a big spill happened outside of a harbor or a marina, and then the marine operators didn't know how to get the latest and greatest, and they started calling a bunch of different 
um, in contact information they had and that disrupts the entire effort and the energy the state and the federal agencies are trying just to put into responding to that event. So that's why we decided to put these steps for you together. The first line of communication for you should be your county office of emergency services. Vivian and team, how can I get a hold of that person? You will use your favorite browser and you would say, for example, we have a great uh, representation today from Butte County. You will say Butte County uh, Office of Emergency Services and that should come. It's a public record. So all of you should have access to your County Office of Emergency Services. Why? Because they are your first line of communication in case of a spill. Also, uh, as we talked during the poll, it is important for you to have that information because you need to know if your facility is included in the county oil spill contingency plan, right? Sometimes you don't even have a clue and that's why sometimes probably you are not embraced in the communication. It's good for you to say, hey, county, I do exist. I'm part of your county. Could you please make sure I am added to your uh, distribution list or make sure that my facility is included in that uh, plan? That's extremely important. After that, your second line of communication should be, of course, this agency, meaning the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. There's a website that I included there. Again, you will receive it again in your follow-up email. Important for you to bookmark it. There's a section also, thanks to the work that we did, that has a tab that is for marinas and yacht club, where the toolkit as well as other information is included there. And uh, they are also super active in social media. And also they have a Twitter or X account. So make sure that you follow them. They are very good as long as the information is available and ready to be shared with the public. They are constantly doing that. They are fantastic doing that. So that's another third resource that you have, okay? Uh, the following pages from your toolkit are related to the oil spill response equipment grant that I'm not going to cover because she is in this uh, world. So I'll make sure that she covers that, but that information is right here for you. It will tell you like the frequently asked questions, who can apply? Yes, most of the time, or the goal is to work with public agencies. We have here representative from private marinas. Cindy will make sure that she highlights how you guys can be part of this uh, grant by, for example, partnering with tribal nations or the ports or the county or the city. So they have been doing a fantastic job trying to embrace also the, the private marinas. Uh, this handout uh, it also tells you what is included as part of the grant. The fact that if you receive a trailer, for example, that can be personalized as well as the training among others. So we're talking about um, pages five, uh, six, and now in seven, now we're going to uh, page eight of your uh, packet. And we ask you a question during the poll about the importance of all of you knowing who is my neighbor in facility and what kind of materials they have. Why is that? Again, one example in particular we had in the Bay Area with a big spill. It was uh, being, uh, you know, responded, et cetera, but the marinas didn't know what to do. They got super nervous and out of the blue, they were like, oh my God, we don't have enough, boom. So one of them even drove like miles and miles to get boom from another marina where at that point doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you are in an emergency situation. You should be ready with all the resources in a peaceful way, able to respond, right? So that's why we told you, please reach out not today, because it's Friday, probably next week, and tell your neighboring facilities, hey, what do you have? Let me share with you what I have in terms of spilled response. What do you have? So we as a team, can I can help you, you can help me, right? Because we suck your community effort. Now, for you to know what your county has, um, OSPER uh, has a perfect uh, updated list of the grantees in their website. Again, don't get scared about that crazy URL. You will receive the toolkit so you will have access to them. And they have the list by county of all the uh, spilled response equipment and grants, <coughs> excuse me, that are at this point in your county. But of course, that's only the grantees, right? There are other 
entities, private marinas that have other staff in their county. That's why it is important, another example of why it is important to contact your county uh, office, of, uh, office of emergency services. They should have in their spill contingency plan that kind of information, right? Uh, another resource for you in case you need extra resources during a spill will be what we call the OSROs or the Oil Spills Response Organizations. Uh, they are organizations that respond to a spills and they have been evaluated by these guys so they can help you. Of course, there's a fee involved there, but they are like they have been working with the state and that's another resource for you to keep in mind. Again, this page summarizes that information so you have access to not only the grantees, but other resources that you need to know. The following page, meaning page nine and 10 of your packet, talks about a very important resource that our uh, um, working group, meaning representative from private and public marinas and yacht clubs, help us to identify that is extremely important for your facility to have handy and updated every six months, which is the resource phone tree. What is that, Vivian? What if an spill happens? Um, a lot of you making a survey when we were working, we decided that a lot of the uh, marinas do have those lists, but they are in somewhere totally like fading. You don't even know what the phone number is there. It hasn't been updated for a year. The guy doesn't work anymore. So this is a great example for you to go back and have something that is visible up to date every six months. And it has the required as well as the recommended notifications in case of a spill. We talk about the two phone numbers that are required by law if there's a spill to report to. Remember by law, and if you look at the uh, blue box we included there, if you're the responsible party, you have to do the reporting within 30 minutes. Sometimes you guys are in your facility and then this ghost that still happened, everybody's playing like, that's not with me, not even related. So you have to know, of course, how to also, as part of the community, make the reporting. We're including the two phone numbers there, as well as recommended notifications. Um, and in addition to that, for your own uh, facility, sometimes let's say that the actual uh, person, the marina or the harbor master, that day is not working, is the day off, right? Like your example here today. Who is in charge if that person is not working? Is that phone number up to date? So that's good for all, all of you and your staff to have it uh, ready. Some of you also belong to a port or a public agency where in a situation, an emergency like that happens, you need to do all this crazy reporting, right? Like the county, uh, the city mayor, the city and county officers, among others. Do you have that information in your list? It's up to date. That's why we're trying to invite you to be prepared. Remember, to be prepared is a key uh, issue here. And then if there are uh, a wildlife that has been impacted, um, what resources the state has for that. We included there your link at the bottom of the page nine. On page 10 of that resource phone tree, we are recommending you also to have handy as part of those listings, salvaging companies, divers, uh, also vessel assist phone number, and also nearby boatyards. Sometimes they are highly needed to help in that process. So this is a great template, again, put together by the working group where your colleagues from private and public marinas and yacht clubs suggested this. So it, we know that it's based on your expertise that we came up with this resource monitoring. And please update this template every six months uh, or once a year. You rotate the stuff so you know your, your dynamic. How many of you have this type of resource phone tree readily available by everybody? Okay, we have here some, uh, and I'm assuming people uh, joining us virtually, hopefully two. Um, the next two pages, page 11 and 12, talks about when you, may, if you want to make a reporting of a spill, even if you are not the responsible party, but you're witnessing one, uh, what kind of information the National Response Center is going to require you? So this is a great template for you to kind of be ready and say, okay, they're going to ask me these questions, so I'll better go and collect this information so it's faster and more efficient because otherwise they're going to say, go and walk and tell me approximate dimension of the sheet. You're like, oh, oh wait, hold on, right? So you prepare these so you're ready. And when you do the reporting, they're going to ask you 
for a, a phone number to call you back if they have follow-up questions. We recommend you to always give your cell phone for obvious reasons, right? You are out there in the field trying to gather the information. You're not going to go back to your office and use the old-fashioned phone number. So this is great information also for you and your staff to keep in mind in case of reporting a spill. Then uh, moving into pages 13 and 14 of your toolkit, um, we know that spills happen outside of your marina. And here in these two pages, we are including the third party claim process. We talk a little bit about those questions. What kind of funding is available? Of course, the state and federal agencies in charge of responding, they have a structure that we already review that they will activate and decide all the different steps. You don't need to worry about that. The system is in place, but it's good for you to know that uh, working within the incident command system, OSPR, your colleagues here, can assist the state and local agencies to recover their response costs. The first page, well, uh, 13 talks about public agencies, but of course we're not leaving behind private uh, parties. So on page 14, you have that information as well. So good to know. And some of the um, uh, different um, costs that can be recovered is included on page 15. Those are samples of the different things that is important for you as a facility to keep track of those expenses, because of course they're going to come back to you and ask, Okay, what did you spend? But of, of course, provide me with supporting uh, information so they can properly um, process all that information. So this is again, a, a sample. Following page, page 16 of your toolkit, this is a spill plan template. So we talk about, we ask you how many of you have a spill plan in place? And as you remember by the responses, a bunch of you said, oops, no, don't have any clue or yes, I kind of know. This particular template, again, put together by input provided by state and partners, marinas and yacht clubs, mentions that uh, even if your facility doesn't have to follow the uh, spill prevention control and countermeasure regulations, and I'll tell you what they are, because it sounds really weird, it is important that all of you have a spill plan in place. So one thing that sometimes it drives me nuts is when I invite people from all over the state to join us, yacht clubs feel like this is this is not with me. I, I'm not even part of this equation. And I always tell you, guys, you have motorized vessels. You have visitors with motorized vessels. A spill can happen outside of your yacht club or even inside. So this is talking to you too, right? Um, the facilities that have to follow the spill response um, the spill prevention control and countermeasure regulations are those facilities that have above ground aggregated accumulated storage capacity greater than 1,320 gallons or completely buried over 42,000 gallons. Vivian, how can I know that information? You look at the footnote of that page, so you will know. But if your facility has a fuel dock in place, you have to have that in place because you, of course, are dealing with either uh, diesel or gas and you are required by law to comply and file one of those plans with your county, your certified unified program agency on an annual basis. Regardless of whether you have to follow that, even my friends with the yacht clubs, even if you're a tiny marina, have a spill plan in place. And in these handouts, uh, thanks to the research and input provided by the working group, we're including there what are the things that we as a facility and my staff need to keep in, in mind when we need to respond. For example, if it's an on the water incident, first of all, to identify the source of the spill, where is it? And once you know what it is, there could be two options. If it's gasoline, and I know we were talking about this before we started with the workshop, Please remember gasoline is pretty volatile, versatile, very flammable and hazardous. At that point, it's good just to clear the area, evacuate the area and make the recording, right? We include there, of course, you know, and remember by the phone uh, tree, all the phone numbers you have to have handy. Let's think that the case scenario is not gasoline, fantastic. Then you will do identify the source. You will stop the source uh, if possible and then contain the, 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 the spill. 
That's why we talk a little bit and probably Cindy if you help us later on to talk about the first responder awareness and the first responder operation training that is important for you and your staff to have up to date, also by wearing your protective equipment. Um, and then you can do the, the, the notification after you have control, right? We included in the uh, green box some information about if you deal with a bilge that is contaminated, some of the recommended practices, and then we included a little bit uh, on land incidents as well. Very important information for you to keep in, in mind for your plans. The next page, which is page 17 of your toolkit, talks about other emergency response plans that is good for all the facilities to have in mind. Um, when we were working uh, with your colleagues uh, in this great effort, we, re we refresh our memory that now, because of climate change, we're dealing with tons of different things, not only spills, but also fires. We're dealing with floods, uh, health emergencies. So it's good to have an emergency plan that is um, easy for you to be able to reach in a very um, attractive color for all the staff to know where it is, but don't create a plan that is 600 pages because when you are in an emergency, you're not going to read your 600 pages. You have to have something that is to the point, no more than two pages, go, right? Some of the components of each of those plans that we want you to keep in mind include site plan, right? What my facility has, like pipes, valves, parking lots, pollution prevention services, including my sewage pump out, my fish cleaning station, uh, storm drains. If you don't have that information, you know you can contact the city to give you the location of your storm drains. Map, fantastic, right? Another component, to develop a spill response inventory list. A lot of people talking to some of your colleagues know where the spill is found in the facility, but sometimes we have heard situations where, oh my God, we tried to access and the key uh, didn't work in the lock or somebody forgot to come to work today and he knows the, the code to access the room. So make sure that that information, which sounds silly in an emergency is key. Also identify what resources you have in your, uh, in your inventory uh, list, right? By description, amount, vendors, and not only that, who can take care of the use absorbance uh, when needed. Um, also protective equipment. Um, we recommend that it is ideal to have for all boating facilities and based on research, at least two times the length of the largest vessel in terms of boom and even more. How many of you and people virtually joining us has that kind of capacity in their facility? Two times? The largest, okay, we have two or three here. How about my, uh, my friends and Cindy, if you can help me monitoring. Okay, great. So that's good, that information is here. And we also included in your packet electronically or as a handout here, the recommended resources for oil spill cleanup for marinas and yacht The list is right here for you to keep in mind. The, uh, the plan should also uh, mention actions. Who's, who needs to take what actions? What person uh, is involved? If somebody needs to make a call in terms of a spill or an emergency, who is the representative from your facility to do that? And of course, the phone numbers. Other components really quickly in your toolkit are a refresher because you are very well educated uh, public that it is illegal in California to use any soaps, dispersants uh, to mask or to uh, try to you know, respond to a spill. And we included that information for you there as well as some of the uh, legal uh, information. I know that's more for your tenants and your voters because sometimes they tend to forget that. So it's good to have that information as well. This packet is found again in the CalSpill Watch website. We have, as you can see in this slide, a tab for marinas and yacht clubs. So you see right there the information. Don't worry in the follow-up email, you will have everything in one place so you're, you don't have to struggle to find that. And just to wrap up this section before we go into uh, some um, minutes of a break here, let's remember that when a spill happens, 
federal and state agencies uh, have in mind different uh, factors they need to evaluate in case of a spill happens, including what material has been spilled, where, next to what, is there a threatened or endangered species habitat, or is going to cause any human uh, impact, etc. right? And they, considering that, will devote certain uh, spill response uh, materials or resources for that. The two categories that are the most important or the priorities are uh, protection of human health and safety. Think about drinking water, inlets or power plants, uh, desalinization plants. The second priority are the protection of natural resources. For example, wetlands, lagoons, you are near one beautiful one here. Um, habitat for endangered and threatened species, right? Why are those two the most important priorities for the state and the federal government? It's because basically uh, a long-term impact, right? And long-term recovery, if there's any. You guys, in terms of the boating facilities world, are a third priority. Not that we don't love you. Of course we love you. We understand the importance you play. But you're mainly kind of a structure. So you're considered what we call an economic site, uh, like fishing piers, uh, among others, parks sometimes. So because you, you are, uh, your response could be uh, faster and the recovery could be, of course, faster. It's mainly talking about infrastructure. Remember that prevention is the cheapest way to control pollution. That's why we're putting together all these resources for you. So you can go back and talk to your staff. Are we doing a good job in terms of our future response, right? Resources in place. Get to know your county representative. Please do that next week. If you have any issues finding them, reach out to us. We will be super happy with Cindy just to make sure that you connect with that. Uh, make sure that you're part of your oil contingency plan at your county level. Talk to your neighbors, get to know them. What do you have? This is what I have. Let's work together as a team. Participate also in the area contingency plan. So they talk a little bit about this. These are great um, meetings that happen where you are able to meet other uh, representatives from the industry, state, federal agencies, NGOs, et cetera. You don't have to come to all those meetings, but it's good that you're part, probably part of the distribution list so you get to know what's going on. What are they talking about, right? And also participate in the Bay Area uh, contingency plan for people who are in the Bay Area or in the Delta or in the Central Coast and Northern California. We will share with you this information as well as for LA, Long Beach and San Diego. That information will come to you so you don't have to worry. You just have to contact them and say, may I be part of your distribution list? Just a learning process. Um, they talk also about calendar, like drill calendars. Great opportunity for you to see how uh, the structure works and how they get prepared for a real case event that hopefully it doesn't um, happen. So let me stop there for a sec and see you guys and let's just start with the room here and then we'll take questions from people uh, joining us virtually. If you have any questions about the packet or the first presentation we just uh, covered. Any questions here? So are, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, um, the uh, marinas and yacht clubs uh, we do have a, a big box out on our dock with uh, a lot of these things that are listed for oil spills and for pumping out boats. Uh, who is inspecting those from the state? Anyone doing that or are they requiring it for marinas or yacht clubs? Who went through this one? No, I mean, I, I don't know. Who both go out and inspect spill kits? I don't believe so. If you have a refueling dock, they'll come out for Coupa. Well, to Port of San Diego will do dock inspections usually annually, depending on the condition of the arena. Yeah. So the question for people uh, virtually is like, uh, somebody with the state will come to either a yacht club or a marina to inspect your facility in terms of a spilled response equipment, kind of like, what do you have? No. Um, and, and we were just discussing here, if you are a fuel dock by law, Yes, your county will come to make sure that, of course, because you are more susceptible to generate a spill, right? Fueling is very tricky. And here we were saying, uh, here at the port of San Diego, the port, because it's like the landowner, if I'm, uh, I'm properly saying this, of course, they don't want, they want their tenants to properly 
um, you know, respond and be ready. So they will come as part of the lease, let's call it that way, that they will say, yes, we're going to inspect you every six months to a year. Every facility is different depending if you're a private or public marina where you are. If you're in a stand, state lands commission, for example, land, they may come also to say, let me check how as a tenant you are behaving uh, among others. But other than that, the state is not coming to your facility to deal with that. That's why it's good for all of you. And that's good that you're asking your question as a yacht club to really spread the word. This is not like we're not talking to you guys. You, it, it's serious, right? Because then the moment that happens, you're going to be like, oh my God, we're not prepared. And this is the goal, just to be prepared. Mm -hmm. John, I'm gonna ask John the question. We have OSPSs, they tip, sometimes they'll stop by the marina or the yacht club just to give some outreach material. So, um, yes and no. So so uh, there's there's a couple different entities that we'll pay a visit to. Some of the small craft refueling docks. Um, we talk about them in our regulations, but the next step up from that would be a, a, a small marine fueling facility, which is larger capacity. Uh, fueling station, which we do have regulations that cover that. Um, we're happy to come out to marinas to, to, if there's recommendations that we could ever do or or just to see what equipment, and if that seems natural, uh, the right equipment for that environment, right? Yeah, I, I really think that they should be proactively inspected more often to uh, be assured that they have the proper equipment. Sure. Um, you know, Marina, Marina over here, they have a fuel dock right there for their rental boats and stuff. And uh, you know, any any uh, yacht club or or uh, marina uh, needs to have all this stuff available, readily right. available. And uh, I don't think all of them do have that. Yeah. True. So I'm going to push it more with San Diego Association of Yacht Clubs. Please try and make sure you're coming to Silvergate Yacht Club, right? Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes, and uh, you know, I don't see a whole lot of yacht club people here. Yeah, you know, that's so, and, and let me let me repeat the question for my friends here virtually so they feel um, involved. So we're having a discussion here. Um, our colleague John Victoria was saying that they they would be happy and tell me if I'm not doing you know to to have like what what they call like a courtesy visit, right? Like go and see. Yeah, look, I have this marina, this yacht club. What are some of your recommendations in terms of spill response equipment? They are happy to do that. My friends, don't worry. In the email, you will have their contact information. They're not going to like me that much, but <laughs> you know, you can bother them. That, that's why you are here. And also here we have a gentleman who is with the uh, Southern California Yachting Association, which is the largest association of yacht clubs for Southern California. They have a sister organization up in Northern California Pacific uh, Interclub Yachting Association and he's saying I would like to see more representation and thank you for being here you're going to become our spokesperson because I always always invite SCYA all these harbor associations to come and I keep telling them don't feel that you're like this no you have boats you have you receive for all your regattas, all your cruising events, and it's good for you to be prepared. So that's good. Yeah, we, we put this out, San Diego Association Yacht Clubs, put this out to everyone and all the yacht clubs, and I just don't see anybody here. So maybe tomorrow I'll have it put out again, and hopefully we'll have a bigger response. Yeah, and, and we have more workshops coming, so I'll, I'll communicate with you, so you can be my spokesperson, because they would say, who's being in? I mean, oh, look. This is one of our members. Okay, we are going to take a 10 minute break. We're a little bit uh, behind the schedule, but we're going to make it uh, work. So I'm going to set up here my timer, uh, which starts now and we'll see you at 11.30. Let's try to come please better like at 11.30 um, so we can continue to uh, work. Thank you so much. Leave, leave your cameras on. We're going just to mute here so you don't get our background noise.
Okay, so um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and get yeah. started. So we respect your the agenda, and I want to ask people joining us virtually if the sound has been okay. If you need us to speak up, Nobi, you're super actually there. Okay, perfect. Thank you for letting us know. And anything you need, please. Um, let us know so we can uh, make sure that mm -hmm. we're embracing you as well. All right, so just to refresh your memory where we are, for everybody here, even in the room, we are right now uh, going to start the case studies. Um, and uh, let me just make sure that I, oops. Okay, uh, Cindy, this is the next presenter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's working. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I, I'm happy to help you. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm about okay. to hit the arrow. Yeah, so let, once you need me to yeah. put your video, you can let me know and I'll. Okay, go back. And this one, right? Yeah. Thank you. Just to FYI, they're having another meeting over here. Yeah, I told them if they could keep the, uh, their their oh, so like yeah. a little bit lower. Um, yeah, push this. Yeah. Okay, Thank so you. we'll try to. We have a a meeting happening on the other room, so people virtually, if you feel there's a lot of noise, please let us know. We'll try to ask them to help us a little bit. Okay. Okay, so my name is uh, Jim Kiatos. I'm an oil spill prevention specialist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I've been doing this job for about 11 years now, and our role as oil spill prevention specialists, um, we deal with a few things. We do we deal with uh, large corporations like Marathon Oil, Chevron, things like that, and they have contingency plans. So we'll review plans and make sure that they're following all the rules and regulations set forth by California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, so that's part of what we do. We do oil uh, contingency plans and we do oil spill responses and prevention. So part of prevention is uh, along with contingency plans, vessels that come into large ports, LA Long Beach ports, um, will go onto the ships, talk to captains, talk, talk with chief engineers and make sure that they're doing their due diligence to prevent oil spills while they're bunkering in LA Long Beach. So bunkering if anybody doesn't know what the bunkering is, is a large ship comes into port and a barge full of fuel comes up alongside and offloads its fuel to the ship. A lot of people already know that, but some people don't know the terms. So I want to explain bunkering. So we'll go on board, we'll talk to the captain, and we will monitor and watch the transfer from a hookup to the starting of pumping and disconnection of the hoses. And we want to make sure that everybody's in unison of what they're doing, following their rules, their roles as participants in that operation because it's quite complex. You need communication between the ship, you need com communication with the barge and everybody who's responsible for that. So as an oil spill prevention specialist, kind of what we do. Also with that, we do, uh, we respond to oil spills in harbors. So we do a lot of, uh, you know, sheens, a lot of reports and sheens down here in San Diego. Um, a lot of reports of sheens from in docks, marinas, um, from, from a boat pumping its bilge to a sunken vessel. Um, so we do that. So we'll get the notification from, oh, yes, somebody from there at the marina will call, oh, yes, put the notification in, and then we will get the notification. I'll get called at 2 o'clock in the morning. Hey, there's a spill in the marina. We got a sunken boat. Oh, really? Okay, how much is there? So we got, I don't know, 1,000 gallons. Oh, great. Okay, so we roll up. Now, with Cindy's program, and soon to be Andrea's, I believe, right? <laughs> um, they provide boom trailers and boom and equipment for a first response. Last well, time, two o'clock in the morning, the people there are either sheriffs or harbor patrol or even dock masters. Sometimes, I don't know, you guys work all night, probably not, but um, you want to have that, the first response equipment there. So that's why Cindy's program is really essential to prevent the spread of any 
deployed. So um, in those trailers, I think she's going to go over that. She'll have booms and absorb booms and pads and things like that to prevent the spread. Of it. Um, so I got a call two o'clock in the morning one night for a sunken tugboat in Newport yes. Harbor. What I'm going to show you, the, this uh, film is different from what I'm going to talk about, but uh, let's roll the film and that will tell you, it's just kind of a case scenario of what you see on TV and stuff. So hey, I want to just, uh, uh, Jimmy, if you can put everybody in context exactly where this happened so they know. Yeah. So this one here is up in the Bay Area. Not exactly sure where, but the one I'm going to talk about after that is down in Newport Beach. So Perfect. this is just part of the, uh, the presentation. And so let me, okay. Contractors are still here working in the dark to recover this boat that sank and to clean up that fuel. We're told that the boat holds 250 gallons of fuel and that it's unlikely all of that spilled into the marina. Still, a lot of it did, and it spread far. This video shows the moment a large boat caught fire last night in Alameda. At about 10 p.m., we had a report of a boat fire here at the marina. Um, Alameda Fire Department responded. No one was hurt, and the cause is unknown, but the boat did sink. It also caused diesel fuel to spill and spread throughout the marina. Liz Williams lives in a houseboat nearby. This morning, I walked out my door at about 10 in the morning and was just inundated with uh, a fuel smell. When I looked at the water, there was a rainbow sheen all over it. I could see that fuel was just really covering most of the water. Video from Sky 7 shows the fuel spreading from Alameda all the way to the Oakland estuary. It is an active incident with the Coast Guard, and they're doing their best to uh, mitigate any of the runoff, any of the uh, flotation of, of um, petroleum products or hazardous fluids that may be on, on the water surface. An inspector with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife describes the spill as minor to moderate. What you can see on the water is kind of deceptive. A little bit of oil in water goes a long way and it spreads out very quickly. He said it's hard to collect this amount of fuel and that the most effective cleanup is natural evaporation. Williams feels more can and should be done. We're in this climate change uh, reality. It, it goes somewhere. It, it drops down into the water. It evaporates into the air. Right. There's, it goes somewhere. It's not like this is, becomes a non-event. Um, and that's what I'm finding difficult about the explanations. And we are told that the boat owners are cooperating and are paying for the cost of this cleanup as is required of them. The Department of Fish and Wildlife says that so far they have seen no impact on wildlife. So, so that was Bob Chedzi up in, uh, who was on there. Um, he's up in Alameda and he handled that case there. And um, he's a real good guy. He used to do all this right here for, for, for Cindy. Um, so the next one here is, this one here is the tugboat William B., which was I was in the, a part of. So kind of like what you saw in the video, a, a fire broke out on this tugboat at like two o'clock in the morning. And um, they called the OES as they're supposed to. I'm gonna show you the number here in a minute. Um, so they got the, the ball rolling, which is good. But because of the fire and the potential that the vessel sinking, they said, hey, let's go, we need some boom right now. So the sheriff's department, already has boom in place, thanks to Cindy and her program. Um, so they went and towed their boom trailer, got it out of where it's at, brought it over, had a boat and towed it around and placed all this boom around this vessel. So that was to prevent the sheen and of any oil that was created from the sinking from spreading. So what happened was they caught fire, the sheriff's boat came over, doused it with water and it sank. It only sank in like maybe 20 feet of water, maybe 15 feet. But this vessel was very important to the city of, Hunt of uh, Newport Beach because it's been there for many, many years. I don't know if anybody knows this boat, but um, and I met the owner there. He was really sad about the whole event, as anybody would be. Um, so, yeah, so let's see. So as you can see, when you call the OES number, everybody gets notified. And then what happens is the Oswald comes out. These guys here are all in their PPE. They'll come out and they'll clean up whatever's left in this containment area. Um, they'll put pads down, take the pads, put them in drums, bag and put them in drums. Uh, same with the absorbent booms around here. You see the, the absorbent boom, uh, all which is in the trailers that are supplied to 
in the city's program. Um, and sometimes it's not enough. So contractors, your OSROs, the oil spill response organizations, they will bring trailers and equipment, and they've done this for many, many years. Um, so, I was, uh, okay, so um, 76 foot boat named William B. Uh, was built in 1942. The firefighters fought the fire for like five hours. Uh, it finally got extinguished at 745, but sadly it sank. So, after a while, let's see here. Okay, so, like I said, so you have, a, you have an incident. So, you want to communicate ASAP to the proper authorities. The OES numbers, um, that didn't ask everybody. Um, so, during the event, making notifications, and you want to secure the spill if you can. Say it's a, a vent or something like that. You want to plug the vent on a boat. Um, and then if you can't, well, you can't. It's, it's all going to come out. Or, and you also want to contain, says, which is the boom. That's real important. Um, and then after all that's done, it's clean. So you want to identify the risk. Protect the personnel, making notifications, 911. If it's a fire, obviously the fire, you want to call 911 immediately. Um, there's a number for Cal OES, 1 800 852 7550. And the national response number, 1 800 424 8802. Um, Which is also found in your token. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I also put the, so that's a public, the Cal OES report is a public document. So I put that in the chat for people online and as well as in the communications packet. So you can kind of take a look at that. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so as we said, you don't want to stop the release, plugging the view, fuel vents, um, and then after the event is complete, you want to say, okay, what are you going to do with, with the vessel now? Now you got to refloat it and either do what you want to do with it. In this case, unfortunately, it was unsalvageable, um, and it went for destruction. So it's a kind of a sad thing that happened there. Before. Um, so this is a aerial picture of what it looked like. Your pointer on here? Yes. Laser? Uh, on top. Okay. So yeah, so any oil or debris that comes off the vessel is going to go to your containment area right here. All this is a contain, but so as your water's flowing in or out of the bay, it's going to go to one end of the boom or the other, which makes it much easier for contractors and response personnel to clean up any oil. So they're all going to corral in one area. Same with any debris. Um, see here. So yeah, that's... Uh, so as you said, so to bring the vessel up, you want to dewater it. You want to place bags underneath it to refloat it. Um, and then any waste that's associated with that is kind of what we do as well. We will uh, track the waste from cradle to grave. So it's created, it's bagged, it's put in the drum, put aside, we will label it, file it, and then it will go off for disposal of the proper uh, disposal facility. Killed the battery with it. We killed it. So here's the uh, you want to label it as well. So this is a bin full of probably debris from the vessel, oil, soil, pending analysis. Um, so we want to track how much oil was recovered within those pads that are now placed into a bin of solids. So there's a process of doing that with calculations and weights and uh, knowing how much was spilled and all that. So it's a whole process of doing that. Um, so yeah, it's all pretty much, you know, cradle to the grave. Um, there we go. Uh, so that's kind of the short of it. Any questions? Oh, I was going to say, Jim, um, I didn't call you up to talk about your, the OSPS functions in uh, the FRT on an incident. You covered some of it. Do you clarify what I, um, I, I apologize for not calling you up to see how important you are. And you are. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're part of the team. That's right. All right. Thank you. 
Any questions here in the okay. room? So, so um, when you first noticed there was something wrong, it was that you saw on the water, the sheen, and then you put the boom out for the sheen, but it's not going to pick anything up out of that, correct? So the, the boom, the heart. Do mind repeating that question? Sorry. Uh, so the question was, uh, when you put the boom out, is that going to stop the the oil? It's going to collect, right? The fuel, fuel versus the fuel, oil. right? So you put the Kadema boom out to stop the spread of any more of the spread of the diesel because diesel is very thin and will just it'll start spreading out throughout the harbor. So you want to prevent that spread because if it spreads, now you're actually contaminating more vessels, and now you have to clean more vessels. So you. Faster you can put boom out to prevent the spread of any sheen, oil, or crude oil. So bilge we, water. Bilge water. Oil, yep. That stuff that will hang up for us. You have something floating on the water and it'll just. The container yeah. boom, yeah. It'll just, it just rest up against pick it. it up, no. no. So if you go back, so right here. Yeah, so go over the absorbent boom. Yeah, so this right here, this white is called like sausage boom. We call it. It's, it's absorbent boom, and that's oilophilic. It will not absorb water, it'll absorb oil mm -hmm. and fuel, gasoline, uh, diesel, and oil. So that there will take the sheen and the oil out of the water and put it into the sausage boom. Contracts will come in and pick up the sausage boom, put it into bags, and put those into drums or a big, a big containment uh, bin mm -hmm. and take those for proper disposal. Does that make sense? It does, but um, so absorbent yes. sauce or absorbent whatever, the sheets, and you put that on yep. fuel, it doesn't absorb any sauce. It does, it, it does. absorbs the diesel. It does. Yep. It does, well, it does we, absorb the water. Yeah, yeah hydrophobic. Yeah, we, we put it on uh, gas bills before and nothing comes up on it. So is that something you're just not seeing or? It's it's hard to see gas because okay. it doesn't have a color. Diesel will have a red uh, dye in it and okay. you'll definitely see that. All right. Yeah, that gas sense? is kind of transparent. Yeah. And with gas, you don't want to collect gas. Correct. You don't want to collect that because if you have a source of ignition, boom. So you want to let that spread out as much as you can within the containment area. You don't want to corral it at an end point kind of as a collection area because then you're making it much more volatile situation and it's ultimately well, you do not contain yes yeah. allow it to right. and yeah. that's why when you yeah. and, and let me just repeat the question first uh so for because virtually we were talking about a okay, fuel gas or diesel spill and as as you see on page 16 of your toolkit it clearly states you have to clear the area. It's pretty hazardous and flammable, so you shouldn't be exposed to that. Um, we were talking about some of the absorbents. One of our participants said, hey, you know, we're using the past, but I don't see anything being absorbed. Let's remember that a gasoline, unlike diesel, is pretty like the color is pretty light, so probably that's why you don't see anything. One thing that I wanted to mention that came up as a question Yesterday, I was training with one of the partner dock walkers, and also in our previous uh, workshop uh, was a question about uh, vendors that are selling uh, natural hair to be used as part of a spill. In the state, these guys are very strict about what you can place on the water in case there's a spill, right? Hair is fantastic to, you know, do certain things, but they haven't been approved by the state to be used in case of a spill. So there's a vendor, because we know that has been trying just to sell that product. And even though we have been telling the company, stop contacting the marinas, because you have to get approval from the state to be able to, because otherwise you don't know if that's approved or not. It sounds fantastic, fair, but it's not contained. The actual hair is not contained, so it can get lost, right, on the water. So make sure you know that what you can put on the water, it has to be inert and approved by the state in order to be used, okay? Um, That's amazing, somebody was trying to sell air. Yeah, I, we, we even went to a presentation in the Bay Area Marine Operators uh, group, and even though she had contacted me before and I told her, you cannot sell a product just because it's fantastic, it sounds like a fantastic idea, you have to go through approvals. She came to give a presentation and I was like, oh, so you, did you get already your license? She's like, no. So you know, and, and you guys don't know, right? Um, so let me ask question. Uh, uh, you have okay. a question. Yeah, do you have it in front of you? No, okay. no, I wanted to ask. Oh, you. I'm sorry. Uh, 
So Jim asks, will the boom burn? And the fail of the fuel that surrounds catches the fire. <laughs> so there's different types of booms. It's uh, mostly booms that you find in harbors are not uh, booming used for burning for, for in situ burning. So yeah, there's a different type of boom for that. So if it gets too close to the fire, yes, it's gonna burn. And you don't want to put the boom around the fire. So we want to put the fire out first, contain the oil far away from the vessel if you can. And yeah, so definitely the boom will definitely burn. Okay. And of course you have to all remember use absorbance, not I mean, including the boom that has a different function, but the used absorbents in California are considered hazardous waste. So that's why once they are used, they need to have like a proper way of disposing it and transport it, right? For all these reasons. So and, I, and I'll cover a little bit about containment boom, right. which can be decon. So that doesn't have to be uh, disposed of. Uh, we use those for no flexibility. Any other questions, Cindy, or I'll take over the chat. Any questions here about what we just covered, which is uh, what Dean did is the a great component of the workshop is to show you a couple of real examples, right? What worked, what didn't work, uh, and any other questions that you can ask to Jim or to us while we're here. Um, please let us know the same for our people joining us virtually. Uh, if, if you have any additional questions, feel free to uh, do that. And now we're going to continue with the last item in the agenda. Which Could I ask a question or you want me to do it by chat? No, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. Wow. Oh, hey, thank you. I was just uh, the question of the boom. I understand all the components, but I was wondering uh, if there was high winds, how that would affect the boom. Yeah, so high winds will uh, will affect like, um, may I see that back to answer a question? Kind of. Do you want me just to yeah, go back? It. Go back to the over. Uh, You'll tell me where. Keep going a little more. All right there. Mm -hmm. So in wind, in a windy situation, this boom, see how it's connected right here via anchors? Yep. So they've connected the anchors in the bottom here. So you're not going to get a, a lot of uh, movement in the boom. But what will happen because of the wind, if the wind's blowing this way, all your product name is going to end up right over here, kind of like it is in this picture right here. So Got it. And, and current will do the same thing. If the current's coming this way, the current's going to move everything back over to here. Come down here. So, does that answer your question? I think so, right? It, it does. I was just thinking if there was enough wind, would the product go over the boom and no longer be contained? I guess was uh, so. There's a possibility, yes, if a lot of wind. Yes, this right here is called entrainment, where the oil and stuff can actually skip over the boom and under the boom. We don't want that. Hopefully, you know, it's it's Mother Nature. We can't really control Mother Nature and the wind, but. Oh, really? um, there's another way of doing that because this boom right here is kind of small. And they make larger boom as well. Um, if it, in, in a windier situation, we use larger boom. It's much larger than this. And so we have a, a larger skirt and a larger flotation well. And that would make it much more difficult for anything to entrain over or under the boom, if that makes sense. That does. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. Hi. So you know that Tony's asking the question. He is uh, Tony is with San Mateo Fire Department. So oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, you were going to say something? No. Okay. Um all, <laughs> all right. So we're moving into the next uh, Thank presentation. You Thank you, Jim, so much for yes, your presentation. Um Jim the clicker. Okay. The clicker. okay. So I think it's still good morning. I don't think we've been to uh, afternoon yet, but again, my name is Cindy Murphy and I work for Fish and Wildlife Office of Spill Prevention and Response. And I'll just give you a little background about our response equipment grant program. Uh, Vivian uh, kind of mentioned a little bit why it got implemented or why we started the program. So there was a spill up in the Bay Area called the Costco Busan. How many people remember that spill in 2007? Okay, all our people, of course. <laughs> Um, so during that response, a lot of the marina operators didn't know a lot about OSPR. A lot of things changed since Costco Busan. We had a lot of legislation and we started the OSPR overview. We started this outreach and education with our marina and yacht uh, partners. Um, so during that response, the marina operators were like, why aren't you protecting my marina? Why aren't you protecting my yacht club? And the reason for that, I think as Vivian mentioned, 
is that you know we kind of have a we have a priority right environmentally sensitive sites if we don't protect those those may take years to recover so that's our priority not to say that economic sites are not a priority but it's just a little bit lower on our list so we started doing during that response uh, the unified command did boom drops and so a lot of the marina operators came and picked up boom so they can then protect their marina but then out of that came the response equipment grant program and it was a it was a true collaboration with the oil spill prevention specialist our executive team in developing this program so it's not my program it's the Department of Fish and Wildlife program. And we all worked really well together in developing what I'm going to talk about here today. So what is the objective? Um, the objective, objective is to give you this equipment so you can protect your marina or your yacht club. Um, and I'll go kind of through that, those stages, but it's really the band-aid. We don't expect you to be oil spill response contractors. You know, you have other things that you're doing. So this is the band-aid, get the equipment out there, make those phone calls to the State Warning Center, to the National Response Center, and that gets everybody rolling. And I would say when you report to NRC or to the State Warning Center, give your cell phone number or someone who can answer that phone call because probably one of our on-duty officers is going to make that phone call. Can you give us some situational awareness? What's happening? And then, then we'll get everybody from the field response team rolling out. So if you don't make those calls, that doesn't activate us. So that's really important. And again, it's any amount of petroleum product in a waterway is reported. So just keep that in mind. I know you're like a drop. Yep, a drop. So it's always best to do that. Make those notifications. So we were really fortunate when we implemented the program, we had some existing regulations that we could kind of tuck this program under. So that spill happened up in uh, the Bay Area in 2007. We started the program right after that in 2008. And I worked with some colleagues from, colleagues from the Department of Ecology up in the state of Washington, and they had already implemented a very similar program. So I was like, okay, give me what you have. Tell me though, what is working well, because we'll adopt that in California. And then tell me what's not working well. What do you wish you could have changed in your program? So I like to think California's a little better than the state of Washington. I don't want to brag. <laughs> um, so who can apply for the, the grant? So any local agency, which is a city, a county, a port district, um, fire departments, we love giving these to fire departments and marinas. Um, because the fire department is 24 seven. They're gonna be typically first on scene. So they drag that trailer and they're ready to deploy if they need to. California Native American tribes. We give these trailers to Native American tribes so they can protect their ancestral lands. A lot of the tribes now have their own uh, marinas, which is fantastic. Uh, port, utility port utility districts, emergency off offices, so like local OES. Um, so when we get an application, um, we have what we call a rating criteria. So when you apply, we kind of go through this rating criteria. Are you near waters of the state? Um, do you have an economic site that you want to protect, like your marina? Do you have the boats and the people to deploy? Up in Santa Barbara, I have a marina up there. Um, they have jet skis. And we did some training with them. And I'm like, wow, that jet ski worked pretty darn well. I was kind of surprised. Um, so these are the things that we kind of look at when we do conduct a site visit after you uh, submit your application. So the funding, it's up to 45,000 now. When I, when I started or we started the program back in 2008, it was like $25,000. So you're probably like, wow, inflation. Well, a little bit of inflation, of course. But we've added different tools to our toolbox. We've added a water gate because now we have our inland folks that are applying. And so they have narrow streams, rivers. A water gate is like an underflow dam. So they don't really need containment boom. Uh, so a water gate, generators, portable lights. We keep adding as we improve the program to our equipment list. The application, how many people have ever filled out for grants a one-page application? 
Is that ever heard of? Ours will take you about three minutes because our goal is not to have you sitting there filling out a form. We'd rather come out and meet you and talk about what areas you want to protect. And really, honestly, if it makes sense to give you the grant so you can protect your economic resource. So it is a one page application. Uh, currently, we have about 80 response equipment trailers throughout the state of California. Uh, we have about five in the queue right now that should be completing here in the next couple months. And then our new fiscal year starts July 1. And so we already have a few folks that are applying for our next fiscal year funding. And our funding source is pretty strong. I will mention um, you do own the equipment. We don't own it. We're just the pass through. We're just the money people. Um, but part of that grant is, um, let me kind of go through the equipment first. So is a thousand feet of boom. And sometimes we might vary based on what your needs are. Like we come out, we do a site visit with you. Once you fill out the application, that site visit can take an hour to two hours, depending on how many questions uh, the applicant has. And it comes with a cargo trailer. So we offer a couple different sizes of trailers and then absorbent materials, anchors, buoys, lights, generator, water gate. So we kind of look at the area you want to protect and then we build your package. What do you need to protect your site or your marina or your yacht club? So we kind of build that package based off of our standard equipment list. We also, part of that grant, uh, once you're approved and we kind of build your uh, uh, equipment list and what you need to protect your site, we offer an eight hour training course. So it's not like we just deliver the trailer contents. We're like, no, we're gonna train you on how to use that equipment. And so we're not the vendor. You'll go through your own procurement process. We'll guide you along the way. We usually provide you a vendor list. Um, I will say there is one particular vendor that has done all of the trailers in California. They're pretty good at it, I will say, um, but it's up to you. I would just say, do not piece it out. I did have someone piece it out up north and then the trailer showed up, it wasn't built out, boom showed up on another day, absorbent material showed up another day. And then they had to put everything together and that was kind of a disaster. So I would say choose one vendor, go with that vendor, they'll supply the cargo trailer, all the contents, build everything out, deliver it and conduct the training. And so Andrea and I, and I wanna introduce Andrea Moore, she will be working with me on this program. So there'll now be two of us, which is fantastic. Um, so if you have questions after this presentation, just go to Andrea or myself, we're happy to answer more questions. The training consists of just the morning, kind of going over health and safety and the hazards that you might uh, come upon when you're deploying boom. And then the rest of the day is spent with you guys, going out on the water, doing some different configurations, deflection, blooming. I mean, we kind of go through everything with you. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. I'm retired from a firefighter. Yeah. And uh, so we've had both fires either down in the Kays or here or even over at the Gloria yeah. Paper. Um, we don't have that that type of equipment readily available. Does the San Diego Harbor Police are they able to get that or a Coast Guard to rapidly bring it over? Yeah, so the question is, who can apply for the response equipment trailer? Does Coast Guard have access to it? Does the Port Police have access to it? So you have to be a local government entity or a tribe. So the Port Police, they could apply. Coast Guard, of course, cannot apply, right? Um, or state parks can't apply right, because they're a state agency. So it has to be a local government entity. But having said that, I would say, you know, partner with someone like private marinas or private yacht clubs, you know, collaborate with your local entity and say, hey, we would like to apply for this trailer. It would be great to have this trailer and all this equipment at our marina or yacht club, but we don't qualify under the regulation, but you do you know, local OES or fire department, guess what we'll do? We'll have an MOU with you. If you apply on our behalf, you apply, it's all in your name, fire department. We'll stage it down at our marina and yacht club and we'll maintain it. And we'll just have a deal, like an MOU between us 
where you charge me a dollar a year or something, or don't charge me at all. We'll just maintain everything and train with it. So that I have done. So if you are a private marina or you don't qualify under our, our regulations, I'm happy to work with you. I would still say apply, and then we can kind of figure something out. Thank you for that. Sorry, Matt. Thank Cindy, you. that was in the chat. Oh, okay. Thanks, Andrea. Perfect. I mean, Andrea and I have done some interesting things. So we're really here to hopefully give you the equipment so you can protect your economic site. Um, so just keep that in mind, just put the application and then we can kind of help you find maybe a local government partner, or if you work with local sheriff or your local fire department, work with them, team up. I put our email, both our email in the chat for those virtually, if you want to repeat that. Yeah. And it's also in your toolkit, and uh, contact information. Well, we'll let you know. Yeah. And Andrea said that it's in chat, both of our email addresses. So feel free to reach out to Andrea or myself. Um, the one thing we learned too is, you know, I, we started the program back in 2008. So I was getting phone calls from some of our grantees saying, do you provide refresher training? Like a lot of our people have left the original people who got the training. So what we did, what we're doing now is we're going back around to all of our grantees a couple times a year and offer refresher boom training. And it's really, it's our oil spill prevention specialists that do that. They're a great team to work with. They go out, kind of go through the contents of the trailer, make sure everything is still in good working order. And then we do hands-on training for the rest of the afternoon, as long as you want to. So that's one thing we started doing. And then the replenish grant. So again, you own the trailer. You're responsible for maintaining it. If you use resources out of that trailer, if you don't have a responsible party, there are other mechanisms. Um, if it's federalized, there's a federal fund. Um, we do have a state fund. And I just want to mention, I know I put it in chat for folks uh, online, but we are paid by the oil companies. For every barrel, 42 gallons, that comes in, that's produced here in California, we get 9.1 uh, cents. So my position <laughs> technically paid by, and John and Andrea, we're paid by the oil company. No public funds to fund our program. That to me says a lot about the work that we do and how we're set up. Um, so I just wanna mention that. And it pays for this program and other programs within Oscar. Uh, so we do offer now replenish grants. Um, it depends on how much funding we have at the end of our fiscal year, which is June 30th, which we are coming up to now. So I have done a couple of replenish grants. They're usually like three to $5,000. So if people, the grantee uses all their assorbent materials, then I can sometimes, you know, have a small grant to replenish that. But your first level when you do use the equipment is always contact the responsible party because you're kind of acting on their behalf. If you have no responsible party or you have a responsible party that does not have insurance and they have no means to pay, sometimes a federal fund can help with that if they federalize it or sometimes there's a little money in the state fund that can help with that. But again, that's kind of that process. And again, we are offering replenished funds as we move forward. Um, so I'm excited about that. Here's some additional information that uh, some links, if you're interested, you can take a photo. And I know Vivian's going to provide these PowerPoints uh, to all of you online and all of you here in the room. So that uh, sums it up. And here's our contact information for Dave McNair, Jim Kiotos, who gave us a great presentation on case studies, and then my information. And again, my information and, and Andrea's information will be in the chat if anyone is interested in applying. Now, I just want to mention to Vivian asked me to go over uh, the first awareness, uh, first responder awareness, and first responder operational. Anyone in this room or in virtual world have any of that training or has Whopper training? Okay. Oh, you do. Okay, is it fro or fray? Has Whopper. Oh, have 24. 24 hour or 40? Well, okay. Oh, fantastic. So typically you would need 40 hour has Whopper to not only deploy equipment in a oil spill, right? But to clean it up. You would need that level of has Whopper. But we're not asking you you know, to be contractors. We're only asking you to get the Band-Aid out there, get the equipment out there, make sure those notifications are being uh, 
you know, um, reported. And then that gets all of us rolling. So if we need a contractor, one of our field response team members will call an OSRO, an oil spill response organization, to come out. So get the equipment out there. Again, we don't want equipment, you know, with fuel. You just let that evaporate and kind of fly. Um, but, you know, other petroleum products, definitely go ahead and use the boom. And then our folks will come in with a contractor and do the rest of it and the cleanup for the most part, if it's if it's a substantial spill or a bigger spill. Some of the smaller stuff, you probably just throw a little bit of sorbent material out there. Then you clean it up, it has waste, dispose of it properly, that kind of thing. So uh, anybody have any other questions about the program? Hey, Cindy, Tony, I had a quick question. Uh, yeah. In terms of ongoing training or refresher training, uh, and we have lots of different folks on lots of different shifts and that type of thing, but it sounds like it'd be a one day. Is there any provisions where you might offer that on multiple days to try to get uh, a little more access to more personnel? Yeah, that's a great, uh, thank you for the question, Tony. Here's the thing, our people, um, we're responding every day to spills. We're doing our regular outreach and education and our regular jobs, right? So it's really hard to do a multi-day. Um, and I've had that question asked to me, especially with fire departments. We're doing a refresher boom training uh, at the end of this month with South Lake Tahoe because they have three different teams that rotate in and out. And I said, the best I can do is say throughout the year, let's go ahead and do team one from the fire department. So like on, I think it's April 28th, we'll, we'll train or refresh, uh, do some refresher boom training with team one. Three months later, we'll do it with the next team. And then three months later, we'll do it with team three. Um, that's the best I can do, but for our folks to be out and not doing their regular job or responding to spills, that's a huge, uh, that would be a huge lift for us. So we're more than happy to come in and do one day training if it's one day training, you have the morning maybe crew and then you can have the afternoon crew. Uh, we have done that uh, with East Bay Regional Park District, but three days in a row is really tough for us to have our folks not doing their regular job and responding to spills and such. So I hope that no, kind of helps. Totally, I totally understand. I, I get it. Everyone's very busy and I, I totally understand. Is there any, uh, do you guys do anything maybe like a train the trainer style program where maybe we could send someone from our training division to... Uh, uh, work with you and bring that content back and just deliver it in-house? Yeah, so we do have a video <laughs> that we can share with you, Tony. So if you want to send me a message and I can get your email and I'll follow up with you either later today or first thing on Monday morning. So we do have a video that you can share with your team or your staff. I'm more than happy to share that with you, if that helps. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. If you, any, anything you have, that would be great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you can share that with me, I can send them to the entire team as well. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the team here? <clears throat> okay. How many up? How many people are going to submit their application? <laughs> I need a hand. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So checking really uh, yeah. our agenda here really quickly. So we are ahead of the game by two minutes almost. So we have time for questions. Uh, while you think about your questions, a uh, couple of things that will happen is I'm going to include here right now in the chat uh, for people joining us virtually the evaluation form for the workshop. We want to continue to improve these programs, try to satisfy your needs. That's how we are evolving from version one to two, among others. People who are here with me, you will receive a, a follow-up email where the link to the evaluation form will be included. I highly appreciate if you please take your time to help us with that. I don't want to chase you the entire rest of the week, next week for that purpose. You will also be receiving an email with all of our contact information. Remember, they are great resources. In case you have any questions, uh, we can help you to connect to the response if we don't know. Uh, we also talked briefly about the fact that it's not their responsibility to inspect you. Uh, but if, they, if you need some support, like a courtesy visit, just to see how can we improve, they will be happy to do that as long as time and resources are available. You will also receive the link 
to uh, the toolkit. Um, and also, um, we're going to send you the PowerPoint. Um, I'm also recording, as you all know, the um, workshop. So that will come to you probably next week. And at this point, I don't have anything else to add. Everything will be in your inbox uh, this afternoon or next week. And anybody uh, joining us virtually, any questions you may have? No, you're quiet, ready for lunch. <laughs> okay, are you still alive there? Okay, good, good, good. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your time, help, and support. Uh, if you or uh, one of your colleagues couldn't join us today, or one of your staff, we're having another workshop on June 20th. Uh, make sure that you tell your neighboring facilities, remember as part of the community, to please come to these educational uh, workshops and we'll see you later. Have a fantastic and safe weekend and thank you for all you do. Bye everybody. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. We got here too.